Welcome everybody. We are in chapter six of ten parables. We're going to be studying parable five men from God tonight and uh, Eric Culbertson is going to be leading the discussion for us. Eric, I'm looking forward to this. Thanks for all of the preparation and the questions that you posted. It uh, looks like it's going to be an interesting discussion. So I'll turn it over to you. Take it away. All right. Oh, well, okay, great. Um, yeah, no, I was excited too until about like half an hour ago. Then I'm like, oh man, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but uh, no, <clears throat> chapter six, um, I'm glad that this one was still available because um, when I was reading through the parables, uh, I really liked this one. Um, I think it's got a lot of layers. Um, and so, but until I did a little bit of research, I didn't really understand kind of where the parables were coming from. Um, I was like, okay, you know, so God kind of usually does this in the scriptures. He kind of sets up a situation or there is a situation and he sends in uh, a teacher um, with a message. Uh, and then um, you see the reaction, the blessing, the cursing, and those kind of things over and over in the scriptures. So the first one, I'm going to I'm going to read the first two paragraphs, and then we're going to talk about um, kind of where where I found um, the basis, I guess, maybe of the parable, maybe not. I don't know, maybe um, Denver just uh, thought it thought it up or was inspired for some other reason. But <clears throat> and then and then I thought then after that uh, we'll go through each one of the men that God sends, we can talk about each one of those individuals so that we'll read from the parable and then we'll talk about the men. Um, and then, you know, in the end, there's a, this, we can kind of just go from there. How's that sound? I think that sounds great. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, first, first two paragraphs, uh, chapter six. God does not force his will on mankind. In all things, he has shown respect for mankind's right to choose. He offered them the choice by sending five men. <clears throat> These five men all made the same vow to God. God, in turn, agreed he would honor the man. They said they each would do five things. Uh, first, follow God's commandments, not touch anything dead, nor drink wine, nor profane the Sabbath, nor cut their hair. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so, so this parable sets up the situation and um, talks about that God's going to be sending five men. And um, the first uh, specific, um, I guess, tenant or um, gospel precept is agency, um, and and um, and so um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So so does does anybody know what the Nazarite vow is? And it's spelled N A Z I R I T E. Um, <clears throat> I've heard of it and read a little bit about it, but I don't know much. And it was very specific and followed a lot of very important rules. The not cutting of the hair was one of them, but I don't know a whole lot. Does, does any specific um, person from the Bible come to mind when you hear the, the phrase Nazarite? Um, well, I I think Christ certainly implies, you know, he's from Nazareth, but then especially the, the cutting up the hair, it reminds me of Samson. Yeah, so exactly. So one of the most famous is uh, Samson. <clears throat> um, yeah, I thought my notes were a little bit more in depth. Oh, we should add, by the way, Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word Nazir, which means consecrated or separated, um, versus Nazareth, which is... Uh, 
yeah, place and a, and a different root. So a Nazarene is from Nazareth. A Nazarite is somebody who's taken the Nazarite vow or consecrated. Yes, yes, exactly. So <clears throat> the um, the, Naz the Nazarite vow um, started with the Levites, actually. Um, and because the Levites were the ones that were consecrated and set apart as the as the um, the ones that were um, set aside to serve God, the other tribes um, <clears throat> had also set up uh, a Nazarite a Nazarite vow or, or a law which um, one of the most famous ones in in the uh, Old Testament was Samson, <clears throat> and there was actually three things that they that they vow. Um, so the first one is they abstain from wine and anything made from grapes. So even the vinegar, um, when you leave the wine out, the um, and uh, yeah, anything that has that has grapes in it. Um, now, the second thing they, they um, promise or, or vow to do is refrain from cutting uh, the hair on one's head, um, but allow the locks of the hair, head's hair to grow, is what it, what it states. And um, now, when traditionally the Nazarite vow can be for any period of time, um, there were um, there were Nazarite vows that would only be for a month, and then others that were for um, a lifetime. Um, and even even the even the lifetime vows could end at any time, um, and they were typically called the permanent Nazarite. Um, so the and then the third thing that the Nazarites did uh, that they that they um, that they promised was they would uh, not become ritually impure by contact with corpses or graves or even those uh, passed away family members. Um, and so um, in the parable, uh, there are two other um, parts of the vow. That are different than the Nazarite vow. Uh, that would be the keep the commandments, which I believe would part would probably be part of the kind of the unspoken, a part of probably un, unspoken part of uh, the Nazarite vow, and also obeying the Sabbath again, another unspoken part of the Nazarite vow. I would assume um, in the uh, Jewish and ancient uh, Israelite culture. <clears throat> so. To become a Nazarite, they'd have to make, um, they'd have to go to the temple, um, and they would do three offerings. Um, and these, this is this is where it mirrors what the Levites would do. Um, I'm gonna watch this. I'm gonna be like, oh man, I say um every other word. <laughs> uh, so. Probably worse than that. I go back and watch these when I'm editing them and getting them ready to record or to, to post. And yeah, yeah, just don't think about that. You're doing great, man. Okay. <laughs> well, hope, hopefully you're learning something. Um, this is this is. I thought this was really interesting. So, uh, the, the when the Levites and they, we go to Numbers chapter six and and in my studies, um, I found a um, I found an old blog post uh, from. Denver's blog from March 13, 2010. So if anybody wants to look that up, he talked about Samson. Um, and we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit. I don't know when, but, uh, but he also makes the parallel and kind of helped me make the parallel between the Levitical vow um, that was made uh, and um, this Nazarite and the Nazarite vow. Um, and so, so the three offerings are a lamb as a burnt offering, uh, a ewe as a sin offering, 
and then a ram as a peace offering. And then they would, on the display of those in the temple courtyard, they would shave their, their heads and then also lay the hair of their heads on the altar. Um, and from what I understand is that when those that would take a Nazarite vow for short term, they would do the, the three sacrificial offerings again to end their Nazarite vow. Um, and then they would again shave their heads and then the hair that they had grown during their vow would also be uh, one of, part of one of the offerings. And then there'd be some kind of gift or something, but I didn't understand it yet. So, <clears throat> but. You still there? Of course. Which is, go ahead. You froze, you froze for a minute there, so. The, uh, where was I? Yeah, maybe it was just us, but you were you were uh, commenting about how they put the the hair of their head on the altar uh, the second time as the close of their of their vow as well. Okay, and then and then there's also some uh, some kind of gift that they give. Um, so so that's what I learned about the Nazarites, um, and so Samson being one. And I believe there's a parallel to the first um, man that God sends in the parable uh, to Samson. But before we move on to that, does anybody have anything to add about uh, the Nazarite vow? With Nazarite, just like Adrian said, thank you for bringing that up, but it means consecrated. Um, and it parallels the, the, the Levites, uh, the Levitical tribe. So go, go ahead, anybody. Eric, I have a question for you. Um, in your in your studies about the Nazarite vow, did you come across this? Because I seem to remember when I was learning about it a number of years ago that you could choose to take the vow yourself, but that your parents could also place you under the vow. Yes, yes, that is that was also yes, I did see that in there. Um, and I think even if you wanted to do the vow yourself, I think you still had to get permission from your parents, one or the other. Um, and then I think the father, yeah, yes, you're right. There's, there's that in there. So, um, and then the, then the parents can also have a say as to when the, the vow would end as well. Eric? Yes. The Nazarite vow and the Nazri Nazarites in general are not a subject to focus in the LDS culture and tradition. So it's of tremendous interest to me that it's part of our interest now, part of Denver's interest, part of apparently the Lord's interest. We have a chance to learn something here. Yeah, absolutely. And as we study um, some of these, so, and it's interesting too, because these five men all parallel um, scriptural uh, Nazarites. So, except for the last two, I couldn't figure out who the last two were. So maybe we can, we can come up with an answer for that. <clears throat> hey, Eric, can I ask something? Sure. Is there any significance behind the topics of the oath? Um, to my untrained mind, these seem rather arbitrary uh, things. Uh, did anything say that there was any particular reason or symbolism behind the particular parts of the oath? Um, no, actually, that's a good question. I have, I haven't, I didn't dive that deep. That's a great question. Right, because you know grapes are part of the sacrament, and um, the the vineyard was used throughout uh, the history of the of uh, the Israelites, and, and uh, 
and uh, the people of Moses and Aaron. They and so yeah, no, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I don't I don't and I would assume that might come from also maybe knowing the law of Moses a little bit better. And I will have to admit I am not a scholar of the law of Moses. In this second parable, I uh, when I was reading through the, the the parable here, it's interesting that there's five things, yet one of them is not mentioned again for the rest of the entire parable. The the first one, follow God's commands, never comes up again. It never mentions whether that's you know kind of the all encompassing. Uh, or if that's very specific to you have a work to do and you have to do that work. Um, it doesn't say whether they keep it or not. Did, did you come across any insights? I mean, it's not part of the Nazarite vow of the three that you brought up. Right. Any idea why that one specifically is included here? Do you have any thoughts there or anybody? Does anybody have thoughts well, there? Well, and, and this will come up on the third, on the third man. Um, and that's the and that's the only one that he doesn't break, if you will. I don't know if break is the right word, but uphold maybe. So, <clears throat> so let's read. Let's read about the first man. Then, um, does anybody want to read? That's that's going to be the one. Yeah, I, I've got it. Two. That'd be the next two paragraphs. The first came alone. He touched the dead, drank wine, and profaned the Sabbath. He, or however, he did not cut his hair for his respect of God. God, who is merciful and patient with mankind's weaknesses, honored the vow for the hair's sake because the man had respect for God. The man was given great physical strength. Some men followed the man for his strength, but they did not honor God. Some followed the man to honor God. All, however, allowed the man to settle their conflicts and disputes, and he helped them live peaceably. The first was tempted by a woman, and he let her cut his hair. With this, he had finally abandoned the vow altogether, respecting the woman more than God. In turn, God, who is just, abandoned the vow as well. The man lost his strength, was taken captive by his enemies, and killed. He was put between two pillars. As he died, the earth shook, and the greatest building of his enemies was rent apart. Thank you. Um, so the first man that God sends in this parable, there are many parallels to Samson the Nazarite from Judges, um, the last judge. Um, as was um, just read, he, uh, Samson, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll start here first. Samson means, the meaning of Samson is man of the sun. Um, Manoah, Manoah's wife, um, was visited by an angel in her later life and was told that the time of the visit that she'll bear a son to call him Samson and that he will be a Nazarite. <clears throat> that he'll draw strength from his um, um, his hair, not being cut. cut. <clears throat> but through Matt Samson's life, from what we know, he touched a dead lion. Um, and um, he drank, drank wine. Um, so just like the parable, um, it was his hair that kept his vow with God, kept God honoring his vow. Um, and we'll read uh, a little bit from Denver's blog post. Saturday, March 13, 2010. He says he's going to teach young men tomorrow about Samson's life and example. 
He conforms to one of the great patterns of men sent by the Lord to deliver his people. That pattern repeated uh, includes a couple of women who cannot bear a child because of some infirmity, age, infertility, barrenness, lack of marriage. Promise made that a son will be sent. The woman couple will receive a son despite their problem. The son then comes and plays a role with which alters the course of the Lord's people. Um, so, in the case with Adam and Sarah, whom Isaac came, Manoah, who Samson came, El Elkanah and Hannah, who Samuel came, Zechariah and Elizabeth, to whom John was sent, and Mary and Joseph, to whom Jesus, Jesus came. There are many others he speculates, but their stories are recorded or known. Um, Samson was a Nazarite. The covenant terms of his dedication to the Lord is set out in number six. And then number six is the, the Levites, uh, um, the, the law pertaining to the Levites being consecrated to serve the Lord. Um, <clears throat> And if we jump to that, number 6, 3 in the, in the new scriptures, um, you can see that a young bullock with grain offering, a young bullock sin offering, and then they're set apart to execute as the service of the Lord. Um, sin, burnt offering, and atonement. So, um, So here, um, the first man being paralleled with um, Samson. Um, if I if I ever said Samuel, I'm sorry. Samson. Um, he Sam, Denver says Samson was a messianic figure, and he foreshadowed the Lord. Um, any thoughts? Any thoughts on those things? As you guys think about what you remember from Samson. Um, learning about Samson and the Bible and, uh, and other things. It's intriguing to me that Samson is not a failed tragic figure. Uh, you read the story, you, you learn about it as a kid, and you think, oh, what a loser. But to have him be a messianic figure suggests that there are patterns here that we need to reach into. Such as? Well, he abided by his vows for a while, for perhaps a long while. Uh, he did maintain his loyalty to his vows and to what they meant. <clears throat> and Eric, I have, I have one. Um, when the Lord tells Nephi, son of Helaman, about the sealing power. Okay. He tells him that, uh, you know, you will, whatever you say basically will come to pass. You, you will call for a famine and you'll get a famine. You, you can destroy this temple. What an odd thing to put on the list. Move mountains, shut the mouths of lions, turn rivers from their course. Uh, Jacob said, even the very trees obey us. These are all these are all powers that can come when you have the ceiling power. But then you can say to this temple, be destroyed, and you'll you'll be able to destroy this temple. It's a really odd um power but it's delineated there in helaman as part of the sealing power uh, nephi was in the city of zarahemla at the time and zarahemla was shortly thereafter burned with fire samson is another figure who destroyed a false temple christ would destroy a temple and it's 
it's um, something that these messengers do. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's interesting. That's a that's a great point. That's a good point too because yeah, I didn't think of that because there was a uh, when Samson died, it, his hair had started to grow back, and he was given strength to destroy the temple. Wow, okay, that's great, thank you. What would you command the trees to do? That's always been curious to me. <laughs> I think of the Lord of the Rings and the treants, but that's probably not that. it. <laughs> that's where my mind goes. <laughs> Maybe make fruit. Make fruit, yeah. Um, so what, what are some ways, I guess, so that's one way, um, what are some other ways you think that um, Samson is a messianic figure? Um, some of the feats that he did. Killing the lion, not sure in there. Any thoughts? Yeah, I don't uh, don't know a whole lot about Samson. It sounds like other people may not as well, other than Adrian, who knows something about a jawbone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um. So. So we'll come we'll come back to Zion uh, to Samson um, when when God is talking to to man afterwards. So I did think that there was a curious statement here. Uh, all, however, allowed the man to settle their conflicts and disputes. Um, that uh, that struck a chord with me for two reasons. First of all, it was interesting that somebody who would be a figure representing Christ. This suggests that many people, in fact, all, it says, allowed the man to dictate some things about their lives. Uh, and secondly, to, to settle conflicts, um, several, uh, several aspects of the, of the covenant came to mind for me about that when it comes to, uh, you know, avoiding um, <clears throat> conflict and, and, and issues and contentions and things like that. Um, yeah, having, having a figurehead, a, a man from God to help settle those things. Uh, you know, the, the saints looked to Joseph to do some of that for them. And ultimately, Joseph said that, that it ended up being a, a downfall or a crutch for them that was negative. Yet, um, I, I suppose it's the same here for Samson to some extent, assuming that that's actually what this means. But it, it seemed curious, not a place for a, for a messianic figure. Yeah, and, and I think also of Moses as well. Um, the same the same situation where he became tired of having to deal with everybody's problems and, and then ended up setting up judges and, and whatnot. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for that. That's great. So, so to just one point though, even though Samson did not follow every stipulation, if you will, of the vow, God still honored him. Okay. <clears throat> so, somebody like to I'll, I'll read the I'll read the second the next the next uh, um, verse really quick here. Um, the second and third man came together. The second kept his vow, did not touch anything dead, nor drink wine, kept the Sabbath, and cut not his hair. God honored him as the greatest born of men, yet his enemies killed him as a threat to peace. Many followed him and were surprised when he was killed. Um, <clears throat> what... Uh, who, who can guess who this 
paragraph parallels this man, the second man. Don't jump to that for 500. <laughs> Absolutely. John the Baptist has been, even even in the scriptures, Christ himself stated he was greatest of, among men. And um, he kept every single vow. <clears throat> and um, God honored him. There. The state. Thought there, no. <clears throat> and John the Baptist, similar, is Zachariah, his dad, um, and Hannah, right? I've read too many names, biblical names, and I'll smash them together for whatever reason while I'm on the spot. Oh. <laughs> um, and they too, similar, there's the uh, uh, angel came to them, and uh, miraculous, uh, infertile, barren. Um, for uh, John um, covenanted from him for so who would my any thoughts hey Eric yes can you hear me <laughs> this is Cherry Ann I'm sorry we're driving so um you know one thought that I had about Samson um and I'm sorry I wasn't able to figure out how to make my phone work um is that his mother was also told by an angel or by a messenger from god that she would deliver this child um and uh i found when i was uh i i went back and i read more about the story of samson when i read this parable because i wanted to know what the the parallels were and i was struck by how similar their beginnings were she wasn't uh, able to have children, and then a, a messenger told her that she would have this child, and that uh, he would be brought up to the Lord. And um, clearly, he didn't keep all of his vow, but he was a type of the Lord in that he he came into this world as a foreshadow to how the Lord came into this world as well. No, that's, that's a great point. It's, uh, um, I never before, um, before this, I think, thought of Samson uh, as a messianic figure of parallel um, in which we could learn things about Christ. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Somebody like to read the next two points a lot on the three paragraphs. Make a comment or ask a question oh, okay. about uh, about the second man here, which we assume is John. I think accurately. <clears throat> it was my perhaps bad assumption, but assumption nonetheless that somebody who makes a vow with God and then keeps the vow they cannot be killed by wicked people. They would have such power given to them that their enemies cannot overtake them, which we see with Christ. Yet, uh, John the Baptist not only was killed, but, I mean, rightly so, many were surprised when he was killed. Um, do I just understand completely wrong what the, what the Nazarite vow is, what the expectations are, or um, is there something else here that that I'm missing? Or wanted to wanted to get some thoughts on this, perhaps. After your mission is complete, speak loud, please. Oh, it's still on. And maybe it's possible that what it really means is you can't be killed or taken until after your mission is complete, or the expected thing you have to do has been completed, because. They all have to die. Everybody has to die at some point. So clearly you can be killed before dying. Or maybe he allowed it like Christ. So it reminds me of a Benedi where, you know, they tried killing him several times and he's like, no, no, you can't do that yet because I haven't delivered my message. So I wonder at the point of John taking the vow um, in the other stories, 
we can see the purpose behind it. There was protection. There was um, something that they gained. For John, we don't see that. But I wonder if maybe him taking the vow was more of a sign for the Jews that he was something. He had long hair. He didn't drink wine. He, you know, lived in the wilderness and was a wild man. I wonder if it was a sign for them, um, this crazy man that is, is teaching truth, and he looks crazy too, that maybe it caught their attention so they would be ready for the Lord to come. Um, I have a comment, Eric. Um, Joseph Smith, uh, talking about martyrs, said that they allowed themselves to be sawed in half and other terrible deaths in order to obtain a better resurrection. Um, Joseph had a premonition of his own um, death and that he would die a martyr. I recall a break in Denver's voice when he was reading about the marred servant in one of 10 lectures. And uh, I took that as a sign of his premonition that he too would be uh, potentially given the opportunity to be martyred in order to obtain a better resurrection. Those are Joseph's words. What might that even mean, McKay, a better resurrection? A step up the ladder. You mean a, a more expeditious step or a quicker step? What, what, do, you, what do you say? Well, as you become more like Christ, you've got to imitate Christ. And at some point, you have to be martyred in order to obtain a, a high rung on Jacob's ladder, I suppose. That's speculative. I don't know for sure. You also said how one lays down one's life matters in the aggregate, which uh -huh. would imply a voluntary thing. Um, with Denver, I get a little concerned about him dying at all because we've been told that if if he is taken, then we might have to go through this generation is over and another um, third and fourth generation until another servant is sent. Um, I just I don't know if if that's Denver's lot this time. Um, I think he has a, another mission. And actually, to, to just bring that into focus a little bit, <clears throat> the Lord says he will be marred, but I will hold him in my hand and show my power to the world in protecting him. So he may be marred, but not killed, or if he is killed, he won't die. Uh, those kinds of things are, are promised to that servant. So if we're going to identify Denver as that servant, then maybe those promises apply to him. Well, I'm having Adrian look up the Hebrew word yeah, so for marred. marred. It marred does not mean uh, what no. it means to us. You're, you're thinking of um, what was taught by Margaret Barker, that this, the Hebrew word for marred and the Hebrew word for anointed differ by one right. by lengthening one character and <clears throat> saying that he was marred above any other man may well be a scribal error that he was anointed above any other man. Um, and so this notion of marred that, that we figure he's going to be physically injured, <clears throat> which seems out of place in the rest of the verse because it talks about the Lord showing his wisdom. Um, and an anointing would, would make a lot more sense. It very well may be that we just have some bad Hebrew there. Well, and going back to Cameron's point, growing up in the LDS church, there was this assumption that if you were righteous or that if you were a leader or one of those in apostles, that God would only let you die if you were leading people astray. 
<clears throat> too. So that might that might be where we get this feeling that oh they're being protected as long as they're keeping the commandments and forming us in the right way. Yeah, I think you're probably right. You you can injure somebody without hurting them in that you <clears throat> discredit them to the point that people cannot recognize the message or what is being taught. You mean you excommunicate them? Excommunicate or we'll even let them cut them off. People won't listen. It couldn't be him because he's not a he's member not or yeah. he's there. He's damaged. <clears throat> So you mar their reputation. You mar the reputation. They mar their business. I think or even use that your business would have been marred if I'm if memory serves in the uh, answer to covenant. Yet your businesses have all been marred, kind of a thing. Um, sure. You're you're viewed as being damaged goods. You're wacko. You're so, crazy. You're out there. In that case, we don't have a Hebrew mistranslation because that would be in English. But it's possible that it's almost a double entendre kind of a situation where you could take one word in Hebrew, right? And by just having it be so similar to another meaning that it could actually carry both meanings. Could be, and you could take Gileadi and believe that, and he could be wrong. Yeah, Gileadi, that, that you know, exactly. he'll be so physically damaged his face will be hamburger you can't even tell he's a human exactly but god will miraculously keep him alive that's that's what Gileadi says about it but in again in in the context of the verse it doesn't make a whole lot of sense i think marring of a reputation makes a lot more sense yeah. and, if, and if that's what it means marring of a repu rep uh, reputation and so forth in the but then covenant then where it says your visages have all been marred we're not all walking around with hamburger face. Right? The, the heart, the heart of this parable has to do with, I think, one of the things is, is God honoring man's choice or, or agency, um, and so even if a man is 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 uh, upholding his vow, and then another one of God's children decides to kill him. You know, God can't stop that, I guess, can he? I mean, so, and it's, and so this, that kind of goes a little further than I wanted to go at this point, but it is an interesting thing to ponder. Um, <clears throat> is God's uh, absolute honoring of our agency, would that stop him from, Doing, you know, keeping one of his chosen ones from dying or being hurt. You know. so, who would like to read the uh, the third witness? Next three paragraphs, I believe. Eight, Asia. Sure. I'm gonna have to hold the button, so it's kind of fun. <coughs> the third was the center of the witnesses. He did as the first. <clears throat> Am I in the right place? Yeah. Okay. He touched the dead, but they came back to life. He claimed in this to honor God. He not only drank wine, but made it. He claimed in this to honor his mother. He seemed to profane the Sabbath, but was clever enough to explain how he did not. He claimed in this to honor, human, or honor mankind. Yet he cut not his hair. He showed honor to God, his mother, and mankind, and kept the vow as to his hair. In turn, God honored him with great spiritual strength. Many followed him for his spiritual strength, and he judged between men with equity and mercy. The third allowed a woman to cut his hair as well. When she did, those who followed him said he was as foolish as the first. They feared he too would then be taken captive by his enemies. Surely the first was a sign and a type of the third, they said, in quiet among themselves, <clears throat> and he was. Therefore the third, like the first, was taken captive by his enemies and killed. He was put between two posts to die. And as he died, the earth shook, and the greatest building of his enemies was rent. So here we have the, the third, um, the middle, um, sent by God, the center, as stated in there, of all witnesses, touched dead, brought them to life, drank, and made wine, uh, 
profaned the Sabbath, but did it to honor mankind. Kept the vow of hair and commandment, so he's, and then, um, did you say a woman cut his hair? No. Sorry. Yes, it does say a cut his Okay, yes, yeah, it And so then that, that brings it down to one, just like Samson. So therefore, um, pointing out again, that the first is like the third. Um, he had great spiritual strength put between two posts. Um, and do we, and, and, um, the center, uh, being Jesus Christ, because the second and third came together. Um, if we think that a uh, parallel to the second is John the Baptist, then I guess, um, it's assumed that the, the parallel to the third would be Jesus Christ. Um, and then between two posts, um, there are two instances of, of symbolism, uh, Christ's um, death that I think talk about two posts. The first being uh, when he was crucified, um, there were two posts that made up the cross, and also that he was between two other um, men in posts. Right, so that would be there would be three. Yes, then I can't count. And the third being that the temple um, <clears throat> pillars were rent um, with the earthquake uh, and his passing. Uh, any any thoughts on the the center witness third man God sent? I think it's especially interesting that it mentions a couple times how he honored his mother. Um, I, I, you know, the first time I, I read these parables, it was several years ago before the divine parents talk and reading it now, it's, it, it means even more knowing that his mother on earth, earth was also heavenly mother and certainly deserved all of the honor that he could give her. And especially with, you know, he even made wine. She's the one that asked him to do that. She's the one who was like, Hey, you should do this for this wedding feast um i i just like how it's included there that that he he intended to honor his mother and that he did i i agree that's a great point i, I didn't think about that right? um that the mother was was noted in there several times great can i add the uh the the idea of dying between two things which happens you know for four of the five men um kind of ties into the idea of judgment in each case you talk about you know samson was was a judge uh it says that the the third witness um judged between men with equity and mercy the fourth and fifth uh judged with righteousness and nations in conflict there's this judgment between two things and then there's death between two things in each case um, even John the Baptist, you could argue, uh, was the same. And so the idea that, that God's word is quick and powerful as a two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of truth from error and bones and marrow, the idea that God's word um, comes into the world and divides and causes people to have to make a judgment. Um, and ultimately, people kill God's messengers for God's word. So I think that it's the, the the idea that each of each of them died between two things i think underscores that notion of the dividing asunder oh that's that's great and i would add to that to to bring it full circle a little bit before the end back to man's agency and how like you said it, it creates a decision that man has to make a choice um and so the symbolism of between two posts, two nations, um, essentially two choices, good and evil, uh, if you will, uh, sim very oversimplified. <laughs> but no, that's a, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. Can I share something too? Um, one thing I noticed when I read this paragraph the first time was the fact that Christ, or this third person, <laughs> did not actually 
it said to not drink wine, but he drank it and and not only drank it, but made it. And so there's all these things that he did that were almost said not to do. And it just made me think about how really the greatest thing we can do is listen to God's commandments for us individually. And he was honoring and being obedient to his father. And yet we might look at each other and think that that's not something we're supposed to do or we are supposed to do. And yet we each might have different commandments at different times from the father that we need to obey until we really need to stop looking at each other with any sort of judgment. I thought it was interesting on the, the idea there about uh, he, he not only drank wine, but he made it. He claimed in this to honor his mother. He fast mm -hmm. forward a couple thousand years, and here we have a word of wisdom from mother that says don't drink alcohol uh, and, you know, or strong drink, right? And wine is for the sacrament. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's kind of humorous or perhaps, as it's pointed out at the end of the parable, irreverent. How, yeah, I'm going to honor my mother by, uh, by doing this thing that she's, you know, probably not really going to like. I that was but it was for a sacrament. A wedding is, a marriage is a sacrament. And so that's right in line with what she thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, one more point I was going to make. Sorry, McKay. Uh, one more point I was going to make. The first um, servant... It says, all allowed the man to settle their conflicts. The next two, they both have many follow them, it says. Uh, you know, Christ, I wouldn't say that he had many follow him or John the Baptist, but it's pointed out here in the, the parable that, that they both have many follow him. And for the last two, we'll see that it's, it's few follow. And it's, it's a descending rate, right? It's a collapsing rate. The more men that God send, the more opportunities, the more examples that are given the less likely mankind is to accept or uh, embrace those as uh, being sent from god so i was going to say exactly what you just said okay. <laughs> the first one was some the next two were many yeah sorry <laughs> but the, the big thing with agency um as i see it is says that god sent these men um What's the exact wording? He offered them a choice by sending five men. And I think what the choice really comes down to is, will men hear God's voice through his messengers? And that's a tough thing um, because a lot of people don't believe that the messengers that are sent are from God. They, they won't even yeah. go there. Joseph Smith, his name is had for <laughs> mostly evil people will not choose to listen to him, that he was the one speaking God's voice. And so this is all about some messengers that God sent, and it's our choice whether we'll listen to him or not. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a great point. And we'll get into a little bit more at the end of the parable, why the men, or what reasons were given why the men uh, a man didn't listen to the prophets. So you both could good segue for both of them hanging up there for a second while we read the last two men. Um, and I'm really gonna need you guys to help me because I have a theory, but I don't know if um if it's right. So the fourth and fifth came together, they both kept their vow. They did not touch anything dead nor drink wine, kept the Sabbath, cut not their hair during the days of their ministry. <clears throat> God honored them with power to withstand their enemies and gave them words to speak. When they spoke, the fire of God was in their words, and men could not disbelieve them. Only a few followed them. However, the men were unwilling to believe even what they could not disbelieve. I thought that was an interesting um, way to phrase that. These two judged with righteousness. The nations who were in conflict, yet when the words given to them had been fully spoken, um, God, in his wisdom, allowed their enemies to kill them. They were killed between two nations, and as they died, the earth shook, and the greatest buildings of mankind were wrecked. Any thoughts about who these men might parallel? 
I have a thought about the two nations that they stood between. So the time of the Gentiles began with Cornelius. Uh, and the second of the two uh, uh, solar eclipses will bring to mind the end of the time of the Gentiles, according to one of Denver's posts. So we're at the end of the time of the Gentiles and the next nations uh, to receive the gospel are the nations of Israel. Joseph and his ministry and Denver and his ministry both are positioned at the end of the time of the Gentiles. And both, both of their missions are to bring about the conversion of Israel. Um, largely, Joseph did not succeed in that mission because he was taken early. But I think those are the two nations that these two prophets stood between whether whether you see this as joseph and hiram as many do or joseph and denver as some do yeah i was thinking joseph and hiram um but the only thing that didn't add up was the earthquake and the closest recorded earthquake in according to wikipedia was november 28th Knoxville, Tennessee. When I first read it, I I immediately went to thinking of the the two men prophesied to be slain in Israel, I think, in the streets in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, that's immediately what I thought of. So others here kind of lots of ideas. So Tell me more about that. What uh, China was Tell us more about the two men and the truth of Jerusalem. Sorry. So it's in the book of Revelation. Um, and these two men um, go to Jerusalem. They have power, the sealing power, basically, to command the elements. They send plagues upon Jerusalem. Um, they preach God's word and are hated because of it. And at the end of their ministry, um, they are laying, they lie slain in the street for three days, dead. And the people rejoice in Jerusalem because these two prophets that came and were preaching things that they did not want to hear and that sent these plagues and had commands over the elements and caused terrible things to happen are dead and after the third day they um are they are taken up to heaven and um resurrected at that point i believe so wasn't there also a case of them standing between two nations as in holding back the entire armies of the world that were bearing down on israel at the time and with the power of God, for three and a half years, they hold off these armies until finally they get slain in between. You know, uh, it, am I thinking of a different set of two prophets in Israel, or is these, are these the same ones? Because you made it sound like it's the people that, that they are defending that end up killing them, and I don't know that that's the case. No, that's not what I meant. Oh, yeah, that that. The, uh, that's who I think it is too. It's it's in our new scriptures. It's going to be uh, Revelation chapter three, fourteen through seventeen, and really the end of thirteen. It talks about them, and that's that's exactly who I think it's talking about. We're talking about some two people yet to come. Okay, thank you. So in Zechariah, it gives a little bit more. Um, details about them and it says oh this is revelation i'm sorry these are the two <clears throat> olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the god of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over water to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues kind of sounds kind of moses-esque here 
as, as often as they desire. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. And they are the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies, dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them who saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up here. And they ascended up in heaven in the cloud and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour, was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the god of heaven okay well that i think that settles the debate <laughs> <laughs> in my mind anyways <laughs> thank you for that that's a that's that's a great Let let me put a thought in your head. Don't believe it. Don't disbelieve it. Just see what happens. Uh, as I read that story a year ago, I asked myself the question, is this one story with two actors or is it two stories saying the same thing? One in one location, one in another location, the great city being Jerusalem, another great city on the other side of the earth. Could this be two individual ministries that are so parallel that it's told as a single story? And I'll just leave that as a thought. Absolutely. I think that's Something great. to add to that is uh, if you'll notice at the end of the other parables, aside from John the Baptist, it, it, their, their temple is destroyed. At the end of this one, all the nations of the earth's greatest buildings are destroyed. And it's not just Jerusalem cheering over these guys being dead. It's the nations of the earth. So. Yeah. It'll be on uh, Fox News and CNN, apparently. People will be sharing. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, though, uh, of the first three incidents so you know samson or one like him john the baptist or one like him christ or one like him the greatest buildings of their society were the temples and those temples were destroyed today the greatest buildings of our society are skyscrapers or twin towers or giant buildings that that house the financial and other interests of Babylon. They're not temples at all, except for one little community that hopefully will be built that will be centered around the temple and unaffected by this. Great. So would you guys like to read just through the rest of them or for um, trying to think what we do. So here's what we'll do. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll read the next two paragraphs and then we'll stop there. Um, and then we'll go uh, man's reaction to each one of the um, men said. When all five men had come and been cured, God spoke to mankind and said, I have sent you five witnesses of my power to bless mankind, all, all under vow. You believe any of them, and you have cured them all. Why have you treated my witnesses so? Why do you disbelieve my mercy when I have honored all those, even those who failed in my vow with blessings for the vow of Satan. 
Mankind responds, he did not like the first, for he kept not his vow, yet you honored him. We see in this great permissiveness to find fault in you for that permissiveness. We cannot accept the God who is permissive. And for those of you like me, permissive means great or excessive freedom of behavior. Allowing or characterized by great or excessive freedom of behavior or allowed but not obligatory, optional. Um, he did not like the first, he kept not the vow, but you honored him. So, <clears throat> here we come back to God's honoring man's agency. But at the same time, even if part of the vow was honored, God still honored the man. And so, does anybody else, can anybody else relate to these Man's reaction to the first topic. Eric, yeah. this this brings to mind Denver noting that not everything that God values is important to us, and likewise, not everything that's important to us is important to God. Almost anything could exist. We think we would have a sense of it, but would we? Yeah, absolutely. And, and personally, I am guilty of this, thinking God is permissive in some way. And the flip side of that, Kevin, is just what you said. There are things there is that, that God thinks is important that we don't understand. Yeah, so me thinking God is permissive is because of my ignorance. A toast, a toast to your ignorance, Eric. Very good. <laughs> hey, Eric, I'd, I'd like to add something. I, I mentioned it last week, but I think this is where you plug it in, and that is in the parables of of uh, Shiloh and um, the weather tree. Denver goes out of his way to 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 make note of the scars of both Axis and this Ponderosa pine, the scars that they had experienced in their, their lives. Um, and I mentioned last week, and I'll just bring it up again to plug in here. I think that's where it comes into play where what they value. And, and I relate the weather tree to divine female and Axis to divine male. With those scars and their experiences, they value things so differently than what we do, and so differently than what your average religion teaches. Um, it, it's what's going on in your heart and mind that they really, I think, admire and how we react in um, difficult circumstances and with what kind of honor we do that. Has anybody been put up or had to struggle with some permissiveness that they think that they see in God? Because this is a this is a deep question and some might not want to answer. <laughs> I know that um I growing up in the church whenever I read the um, parable of prodigal son I tended to re relate more to the son that stayed home. You know, I'm like, because I could see myself in, in that son. I could see myself seeing someone come back and being treated okay and being like, um, I was doing everything right. So, so I, I can certainly relate to, to looking at, at others and, and the things that they do and the things that they're forgiven for. And especially in the past, but still, still now, sometimes wondering why they get a pass or why they, you know, didn't have to suffer the natural consequences of it. Um, so I'm certainly guilty of that. 
I would add, uh, how many of us, uh, and be honest now, we we're all LDS, how many had a great deal of difficulty accepting that God would send a servant uh, on a Harley who was a lawyer from Sandy, Utah, and he not only peppered his talks with hells and dams, but the occasional bullshit. Yep. I mean, I, I literally had people say, nope, that's it. Any man Wait. who talks like that can't come from God. Can you add Republican, white, privileged man? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, and I agree. Thank you for that. So, I, um, and 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 even on on the flip side, so that the next paragraph um, said, we did not like the second, for he was austere. Okay, and for those of you like me, austere <laughs> definition. Severe or strict in manner, attitude or appearance, or having no comforts or luxuries, harsh or aesthetic, aesthetic, or having an extremely plain and simple style or appearance on the door. So that's the definition of austere, and could not be liked by common men who are prone to err, who cannot accept a God who is austere. So on the flip side, God sends one who is, is has um, weaknesses and breaks part of the vow. And then on the other side, he sends one that is perfect in every way. Um, and God has, and the men have the same complaint. We can't relate with them. So. It, it's, it's interesting because I think there are ways that we can relate to all of them if that's what we want to do. If that's what we're looking for, I think that there are ways that we can say, yeah, you know what, I, I can relate in some way to, to, to that or some of those things, uh, all of the extremes. But if it's not what we want, if it's not what the connections we want to make, it's a whole lot easier to say, oh, no, it can't be that because insert whatever you want to put here for your reasons, your justification. Yeah, absolutely. That, that reminds me of that parable of, of the horses of Shiloh, right? They were looking, they wanted a specific look of this statue, although that's not at all what Axis was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same type of deal, right? So we would look at John the Baptist today probably as a pot smoking hippie from Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Probably have red locks and all that kind of stuff. So. That's yeah. because we probably all expect these men from God or these servants to look like the leadership of the LDS church. <laughs> I mean, that's respectful in the world where yeah. sheep scrubbing. Right. <laughs> and that's the land that's the land that we kind of grew up thinking. Yeah. We should be looking for. We like then, our wolves to come in sheep's clothing, as Annette said. <laughs> Wool yeah. suits. Wool suits. <laughs> um, that the third, we did not like the third, for he was irreverent. Uh, I, knew what, I knew what irreverent was, so I didn't think that one. Not honoring the things we hold sacred. We cannot accept a God who is irreverent. And then they said, we did not like the fourth or fifth, for they spoke only of danger and warning. We cannot accept the God who speaks warnings, threatening us with, with great danger. And then they pose a question. So the same thing is like, it, it, it doesn't seem like God can win because with each of the servants that God sent, they had a, a, a complaint or a reason where they couldn't, um, they couldn't follow them. So then, they, then, then they ask God, "Why did you not send us someone who was neither permissive, nor austere, nor irreverent, nor speaking only words of warning and danger?" Um. So what? What do you guys think about that? Have you? I mean, introspectively, I'm going to answer yes. I have asked that before. 
um, what uh, what do you guys what do you guys think? Have you had similar um, thoughts? Who would be okay? So in, I guess the question would be if somebody wants to answer, who would be the perfect prophet for God to send? Well, clearly we want someone who's going to tell us what we want to hear, speak to us words of comfort, maybe preach a gospel of prosperity, that if we just do certain things, we can buy all the blessings we want from God. In fact, God owes us, and we're all headed for greater health, wealth, happiness, comfort, and joy, and peace than we could ever imagine, and that's what this world's all about. And anything else comes from Satan. Uh, in fact, if you'll pay your tithing, I promise you that the Lord will bless. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah. Well that's true. I guess you can that's true. I guess you could look at religion and see how they created they created a, a, a god, if you will, who does have attributes who they where we project some of our our own wishes, I guess, if you will, but we want in a prophet of God. If you're asking who's the perfect prophet, I think that depends on who you yourself are and what you value and respect. If you think about the Jews, who was the prophet they were looking for? They were looking for a military leader. That would have been their perfect prophet when they were waiting for the Messiah to come. And Christ himself was not that perfect prophet who they expected. And I think it's important we all look within ourselves and say, all right, what do we respect as someone who has inherent authority, who we would believe easily. Is that what we're expecting or are our hearts open for whoever the Lord is actually going to send? Yeah, and along those same lines, I, I know a lot of the time when talking about religion with people, if they disagree with someone, um, it, it's popular to throw out this, well, the God and I, God I believe in doesn't do that. You know, my, my God isn't that way. And I completely understand that inclination and kind of have to check it and realize that that thing that I think is not okay, that might be the way that God is for reasons that I don't understand. And we always have to keep that open mind that we don't know better than God and maybe we need to still work on getting to know him so that we will know his actual character attributes and perfection. It's almost like God will zig when we expect him to zag as part of God's method. It's almost like he's challenging us to proceed on faith. For instance, would any devout, spiritually minded person ever resonate to a messenger who said in a public talk, uh, is that a D cup? Well, we just laugh ourselves silly. And most of us would say, well, I hope he says something more like that again. But in our past lives would say, oh, no, no, this is a sure sign. Uh, this guy's off the deep end. I think it's interesting that we can look at this parable and read it and pretty much all jump to pretty quick conclusions recognizing the prophets of the past, those that have already come. We can, we can read a little bit of a parable about them and say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's clearly clearly John the Baptist or that's clearly Christ. Yet we read the little bit about what's to come and we really don't know much. I'm betting that when it happens and we are looking back at it, we will be able to very clearly and quickly identify who fills the role. And I think that this is a very great way to look at uh, how prophecy is so clear from one side of the, of the uh, experience and so vague from the other side that, you know, the perfect prophet or the, 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 the epitome of, of the, the messenger or who it should be, we can have all kinds of ideas and looking back at it, we can say, oh yeah, God knew exactly what he was doing. This was exactly what God had uh, in plan here. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's it's 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 hard sometimes when I do introspection um, and see uh, and almost feel well. You know, I was I was there, and now where am I? Um, one one thing that was interesting, and I look on, and I think a talk that Denver gave. I can't remember if he talked about Adam and how Adam was uh, one of the great prophets, and he essentially was a gardener, and and he didn't, and that 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 you can look at the attributes of a gardener and think that that would be more of what a prophet would be, and that instead of punishing Cain. The only thing he did was was kick him out. That's, and so that I remember that being a, a time in my life when I thought, wait a minute, maybe I don't know what a prophet is. <clears throat> well, let's let's look at God's reply. Um, does anybody want to read the last bit of it, or I can I had a comment if it, I can chime sure. in. Sure. Just one on it. I guess I've kind of wondered. Like when I'll take Isaiah when he gives his retort and says, "Like I'm a man of unclean lips." A view I've had is that I don't I don't think he was being false, humble, but he, like that he seriously had been beaten up by a fault, and he knew it was a fault, and it, like it had been proven to him again and again and again and again that this is a problem that he's dealing with. And when he brings it up, it's like, it's not dismissed, but he's given a cover for it, that it won't hold him back from doing what he's being asked to do. And in that case, if that's what it is, then a servant can really have a flaw. Like, and it's not that that's like, I guess, the flip side of that, if you just looked at a servant and said, well, he's doing that and he's a servant, so that must be great and okay and it's not really a problem, that may not really be the case. It may really be something, maybe you shouldn't adopt that same thing and that that's an issue. God's grace can cover it, but it doesn't necessarily mean, hey, go and adopt every aspect of what that person's doing because, you know, God can excuse that. Anyway, to me, it gives an interesting thing that I think they really can be flawed. And it doesn't necessarily mean we should pick up on those flaws and just think that they're um, no big deal. Well, yeah, Jared, exactly. And I think that it goes back to also that we all kind of have our, our own steps of progression that we're that we're going to go through and for one that's going to mean that their flaw um, might be one of the last steps of progression that they'll, they'll go through and maybe they might not make it through this life but then they can still do things for God in the time of their life at least that's what I hope anyways because <laughs> I continually um, you know make the same mistake over and over um, but thankfully, I'm not in a role uh, where um, I'm being looked upon as some kind of example. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Jim. That's great. Appreciate that. In, in light of that, it, I mean, it gives me hope that, you know what, I, I, I have examples of, of imperfect people who were sent by God and had important tasks to do. Um, yeah, I should have a, a high expectation and, and do my best, but I don't, it's not a one strike policy. Clearly God is, is uh, able to work with all kinds of tattered ruins as it were. So let, with, with those things in mind, because those are all great things, let's, um, let's read God's uh, reply and to the end. Is somebody feeling inspired to do that? I can read it. Sure, great. God replied, you cannot be pleased. If I send you one, you will say you want another. If I send the other, you will say he is too unlike the first. You cannot be pleased. I cannot do it. 
nor can my witnesses, no matter who it is I send. I will depart from you, therefore, and take with me my witnesses and those few who chose to follow them. As for you, you can go away unwarned, uncounseled, untaught, and unprepared against the day. We'll go ahead from the end if you would like. Okay. And mankind was pleased with God's saying, thinking themselves freed from a great burden. Yet they assumed the burden to live without God in the world. God, his five messengers, and those who chose to be with them departed and lived in peace, which pleased them. Mankind, however, descended into chaos, which pleased them. Since all mankind were invited, God was fair. Since all mankind chose for themselves, God was just and men were free. Since all were pleased with their choices, God was equal. Since there was great disparity between the final result, God was patient. So there's, there's so much in those last couple of paragraphs to unpack. Um, it, in the one, God almost seems like he's throwing up a hand. Just like, look, you can't, you can't be pleased. And, and I worry sometimes when I read that, I think, oh, that's, that's how God feels towards me. <laughs> so he's just like, oh, you just, I just can't help you. That's how I feel sometimes. But I know I shouldn't feel that way. Um, <clears throat> but with, with God having sent the five men and given everybody the choice, He's, he's essentially done his part. What what else could he have done? I mean, what what do you guys think? Is there is there an answer to that? Hey, hey Eric. Yeah. I, at, at, when I was thinking about this earlier, it was back to our earlier discussion. So he sent five individuals um, with varying personalities, approaches. And the people of the world had an issue with all of them. I think the point we can, one point we can take from this anyway, is that the Lord saying, I know all the things that you guys respect um, and disrespect. So I'm sending you everybody so I can, you know, make somebody happy, but none of it matters. The only thing that matters is what their message. That's all that matters is their message how they act within certain reason, I don't even care about. I just want you to listen to the message and follow it. And the rest doesn't matter. And I think as growing up LDS, we're so hung up on all these weird little things that we really struggle with that. And it's, the Lord's almost making a joke of it here. <laughs> I sent you all these guys, and, and you could call every one of them weird, depending on what neighborhood you grew up in. But that isn't the point. It's the message. It, yeah, that's a great point. It, well it reminds me also that, uh, you know, God didn't send the messengers to prove to God who they were or what they would do. And he's not, he, he points it out here that you can't be pleased. If I send you one, you'll want another. If I send you the other, you'll want, you'll say you was too unlike the first. The, the point that, that I think God is making is, isn't that, well, I mean, they weren't good enough for me. No, he's saying that it doesn't matter what I do for you. You're not going to accept it or embrace it. And the point is to draw the attention to the people of that issue, not that it's an issue for God. God apparently doesn't, doesn't require that stringent sort of a, uh, of a, of a following of the vow, as we see that, uh, that that doesn't always play. And that vow was born in the law of Moses, and and we we know that the law of Moses is very, um, what was it, commandment oriented and like duty oriented, um, and we know we know God as He taught in, in the in the streets that uh, loving God and loving mankind those are the two great, uh, loving your neighbor are the two great commandments. And it would supersede silly things like how many steps you take on the Sabbath course. 
Um, one question that I wanted to just um, get your guys' opinion on or, or, or your thoughts on opinion. Um, um, man, mankind was pleased with what God said. God essentially throws his hands up. And they were like, oh, phew. And they felt relieved of a burden. And then it says that mankind, however, descended into chaos, which pleased them. I'm, I'm curious, what are some of your thoughts about um, this chaos? Because on the one hand, well, go ahead. I, I'm only curious. I kind of take it like, not that it's, oh, so pleasing chaos. This is great. More that this was, you know, what's your pleasure? What do you please? What's your choice? So I, I take it in terms of they descended into chaos, which was their choice. God didn't do it. Yeah, I think it goes back to the agency thing too. Yeah. I take it as um, it, it's better to be in a world of chaos where there is no order than to be in the presence of order and know that you fall short of that. I think you would rather be in a world where you can justify away anything it, instead of being in the presence of God where you wholly feel your inadequacies. And I just, there was somebody who popped up and said, like, kids like having a messy room. Like, can't get your kids to clean their room. How many times you get to the point where you're just like, fine, live in filth. But they love it. <laughs> Whoever that was, that was a great, that was a great point. I have a question. Um, while we're talking about each of the, the five different men through this parable, we're operating in a very distinct sequence of time. We know that the three have already happened. We know the two is yet to come. Um, it's not until after those final two men that we have all this interaction with God. Mm. What does, is that a continuation of time the way we see it? Are we going to see a time come where there's going to be this kind of interaction with God? And what is, what is that actually going to look like? Or could it just be? That's great. I have no idea. That's a great point. Could it just be the Lord and his followers separating from the world and, you know, going to build New Jerusalem? Departed and lived in peace. When, so when I was reading through this, I, I connected that timeline and actually wrote, you know, the time when God begins to speak to mankind and, and outlines, look, I sent you these people. Here's how you treated them. You killed them. And I mean, that sounds very much like a judgment day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was not later on. It says that they're not going to be prepared. So as for you, you can go away unwarned, uncounseled, untaught, and unprepared against the day. Against what day? If, if they've already encountered God and been judged, what's the future day that's coming? For, for me, it's the, it's the parable, um, the great competition. That's, to me, that's where that comes into play. When they're all together after the competition and they're having their, right. their feast. And everybody's invited, and everybody gets a say. To me, that's 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 what I plugged in. Not saying that's right, but that's what I plugged in there. The interaction with God here seems to me to come before the Zion-like period, because that's when we start to see the division of the people. Right? Some go to live in peace, and the others devolve into chaos. So there's got to be some defining something. I mean, this is, this is very much the way he lays it out is very much a communication with, with God. It's not just a, we're, we're doing our own thing. I mean, there's something happening, not just with those of us who are seeking for that, but there's something that's going to happen with the people who are going to choose to devolve into chaos. Well, I mean, what uh, we're told that Zion will be a place of refuge and peace, and the, rest of the world kind of will devolve into chaos, and there will be calamities and plagues and earthquakes and you know all the destruction.
procession that comes until the Lord finally comes in his glory. Yeah, so are, are the earthquakes and the destruction and the plagues that are to come, is that God speaking to the people? Is that euphemistically God speaking to the people here? Saying, look, I've sent you these things and you haven't. Where he preaches his own sermon? Yeah, I think so. So then where, where does God go and take the people? Is that fleeing to a refuge, fleeing to Zion at that point? Or will there already be a place established? Or are they removed from the sphere altogether? I don't know. There again, we can look at the past and we can find it really easily. And we look at all of the future stuff and we don't know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, go ahead. I was just going to say, against the day, I mean, that's kind of rephrasing against the harvest. So I'll have fruit laid up against the harvest. And as far as I understand that term, that is at the end of the millennium when uh, Lucifer is unleashed and... Sometimes it's laid up against the season. Or laid up against the season, right. And then Thanks. come at the season in the end, and my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire, is how the, the parable, the allegory of the olive trees ends. Right. The season. Well, so it would be the end of this creative cycle. Right. Well, a day is a period of time. A season is a period of time. It's, I think that that, that, that that lines up. Yep. You know, and, it, and it, what I think is great is as I've been watching some of the videos from the previous um, parables, I guess I'm on a, a lower tier. Because when I read this, I really, I really think about um, God's agency, and I'm not saying this to, to whatever. I'm just saying my own lowness. I think of God honoring agency, um, no matter what. And and in the end, because of God honoring agency, um, the, the the statement here. Um, all were pleased. Even those that just chose not to follow descended into this chaos. Um, they still were happy. Those that chose were happy. And then, and then we learn a couple of things about God because of his, uh, and, and him being able to honor, uh, agency and the choice of mankind. We see that all were invited. So the invitation is extended to all. Um, and and that makes God fair. <clears throat> While mankind chose, God was just, and men were free. Um, God was, and then it says God was equal, equal, and because they were all able to uh, be pleased with their choice, and so even though there was a great disparity between those that chose and those that didn't choose. Um, God was still able to, um, he says God was patient, um, and, God, and God was able to uh, continue to be perfectly, um, perfect in the way that he honors our, our agency. Um, and then how this parallels with events to come, uh, I, 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 uh, I am thankful for your input because I, I still don't understand or see it, but I think it's great that there's so many layers in these stories um, that no matter where you are in your uh, progression, if you will, or your spirituality with God, you still can uh, you know, learn a lot from it. And that's what I, I think is kind of the beauty of of these, I always loved um, poetry, um, and as I read poetry later on in my life that I've written um, when I was like a teenager, or I read the same stanzas and and uh, works of, of poetry that I love, um, specifically Shakespeare. They they mean something later on different. With a different point of view, and, and so this is, I think it's great, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to do this and be able to hear everybody's points of views, and and, uh, and so thank you, everybody.
I don't know if I'm, I mean, I've got a bunch of other questions, but I'll just kind of leave it open um, to everybody to talk about some of the things that they learned from this so that I can be more inspired. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. I, I've, uh, you know, really enjoyed the discussion and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you look at yourself and, and say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm maybe not as well versed in some of these things, but you brought up several things that, that uh, to me, I read through and I've read through this many times and you brought the, brought things to my attention that I hadn't considered before. I think that's part of the beauty of parables is that they can mean so much different to different people. We can all learn from one another in our discussions with it. And I absolutely love it. Anyway, thank you uh, again for, for preparing this. And uh, yeah, does anybody else have last minute things to bring up or should we go ahead and close? I just really appreciate uh, somebody bringing up the idea that the last two were the two servants that die in the streets of the great city. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that and many of you had. That was great. Thanks. Thank you, McKay. Very good. Well, uh, I'll close for now. We'll uh, pick it up next week with uh, Chapter 7, Hope in Tarwater. And uh, Brad will be teaching that. Looking forward to it. So uh, thanks again, Eric. And uh, tell everybody a happy night. Thanks for joining. And Thank, looking thank you again, everybody. Kevin, I'll be calling in you a lot, so you better be ready. <laughs> Kevin, great well. job, Eric. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Very well Good done. to see you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.